This morning's first scripture reading from the Old Testament, from the book of Psalms. We'll be reading the first three verses of the 46th Psalm and also verses 10 and 11. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though the waters, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. May the Lord add his blessing. The second scripture reading this morning is from the New Testament, from the Gospel of John. I'll be reading verses 16 through 21. And if you're using a Red Church Bible, that can be found on page 1034. Again, the Gospel of John, verses 16 through 21. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were headed. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's commit this time to prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would take control of this time. Teach us your word and speak to our hearts. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So folks, uh, John chapter 6, verses 16 through 21 is a very short passage of scripture today. Now, don't get too excited because a short passage of scripture does not mean a short message, right? Just like a long passage of scripture doesn't mean a long message. Uh, now, if you look at this passage, it, it is simple, straightforward, right? But I'm going to suggest to you that when we take a look at the context, it's profound. And there's a lot more here than just simply meets the eye. Now, what I want to do is I want to sh kind of share some timeless principles and devotional thoughts. But a cursory reading of this passage suggests that the disciples willingly got into the boat. Nothing could be further from the truth. Now, this is why when you come to the Gospels and you look at one account, you want to make sure that there isn't other accounts and in the other Gospels. And if there is, you want to put them side by side and you want to look at them. Because John gives us a very, very simple, straightforward reading. Matthew's way more detailed about it. And Mark actually brings in some other stuff. If you go to Matthew and Mark's account, Matthew 14, verses 22 through 33, and Mark 6, 45 through 52, their account says that Jesus made them get into the boat. Willingly and being made are worlds apart, right? That is to say that he compelled them 
by way of a command to get into the boat. It's kind of like, you know, your kid's kicking and screaming, and you say, no, you got to do this, right? And, <laughs> and so, I want you to stop and think here. God ordered the events that evening, as he does always in life. And we readily miss that now, don't we? We miss that truth. I couldn't help but think of the lyrics in the great hymn, Be Still My Soul. I'm going to read the first paragraph to you. I don't do special music these days. I don't think I really ever did it. But uh, be still my soul, the Lord is on your side. Bear patiently the cross of grief and pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change, faithful will remain. He, he faithful will remain. See, I can't even read it, let alone sing it. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend, through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Thorny ways, stormy ways, roundabout ways, through various ways. This passage is about God ordering and providing. He set it up for the disciples, as he does. And this principle is so true in all of our lives. He orders events, and he provides in those events. It, it, in the words of Jesus in the text here, uh, it is I. <laughs> How simple. It is I. Uh, do you know that it is I, the phrase it is I, can be translated I am? In, in John's account, if you take a look here, the words do not be afraid follows after it is I or I am. But if you go over to Matthew's account, before it is I or I am, we find the words take courage. And so we have take courage and do not be afraid as kind of bookends with the I am, it is I. And, and we're to take courage. It doesn't matter what God sends our way, we're to find him in those events because he's ordered and provided in them that we might learn what he wants us to learn, that we might grow in seeing his provision, and that we might be stretched spiritually in those events. I, I've said this before, I don't have to say it, you know it. Uh, who likes to be stretched outside their comfort zone? I'm the first one to say that I don't like to be stretched. I'm very traditional, I like to be, you know, like in my comfort zone. Who wants to be stretched? The, the first devotional thought and principle here is, is dealing with God's presence. Now, they got into the boat and they took off without Jesus. Now, it, it's kind of an odd thought when you think about that thought. I mean, when in the scriptures do they typically take off without Jesus? Right? It, it's really not an odd thought. Yes and no, it is. Because scripture consistently presents Jesus in the midst of his disciples. As you go throughout the Gospels, it's Jesus and the disciples, Jesus and the disciples. But here, it's Christ who sends them away. And so, again, this is a divinely orchestrated and significant decision on Jesus' part. He's got something that he wants to accomplish in the life of the disciples. Now, if you notice the placement of this uh, verses 16 through 21, it actually happens after the feeding of the 5,000. Now, why is, why is that significant? Because Mark tells us, after the winds and the waves died down when Jesus got into the boat, Mark tells us that they did not understand the feeding of the 5,000. Right over their head. In fact, he goes on to say that their hearts were hardened. They missed what God was doing. They did not perceive what he was trying to teach them. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's like the story of my life, right? I mean, constantly. How many times do I miss what God was trying to teach me? Listen, I was in a mom and pop grocery store shootout when I was 32 and I didn't see, I mean, three bullets, like, point blank. And I had a headache till like, 11.30 that night. 
You ever go to the gun range and you have headsets on? You take them off, you're in a large area. You do this in the size of uh, these two closets put together. You got a headache for a long time. I couldn't see for two months what God was trying to teach me. I'm like the disciples. So, what was Jesus trying to teach him? That he's the great I am, that he's the bread of life. That's what he was trying to teach them. And if you take a look at chapter 6, verse 35, the crowds that Jesus fed the day before, he says to them the following day, because they came over from the other side of the lake, right? The disciples go over, Jesus meets them on the water, they get to the other side, They're looking, the, the crowds are looking for Jesus, the 5,000. They finally track him down on the other side. And he tells them that I'm the bread of life. That was the point of the whole, the whole feeding of the 5,000. And they missed that great truth. And it's interesting because when you go through John chapter 6, that whole chapter, Jesus develops that thought. And, and what's even more significant, you start to see that many disciples, those that were following, started to fall away because they couldn't accept that, sadly. Now, what does the great I am and the bread of life have to do with God's presence? Well, when you take it as I, or I am, it's the grammatical form of the Hebrew word, verb, as you know, it's present tense, to be. If you translate that thought theologically, what is, what is Scripture telling us? God is. In every event, in every ordered life, and a part of detail in life, He's there. God is and present. You know, it, it's very interesting that they did not want to go into the boat without him. And so I was thinking, well, why is that? Well, you know, you might say, well, it's Jesus. They wanted to be with Jesus. I, I think I might know why. If you take a look at the gospel accounts, there was one prior occasion where they were in the boat with him, and Jesus was sleeping. And they woke him up because another storm came up. And they said, Lord, don't you care that we're perishing? Uh, that's, that's in Mark chapter 4. Mark's similar account to John 6 is Mark chapter 6. You see? So when you start to study the Gospels, this is the deja vu event for the disciples all over again. They are terrified <laughs> of going out on the water without him. Terrified. They wanted him physically present. You know, I had a guy years ago tell me, unless he's standing here physically, I'm never going to believe. I got, I got to see him. For the disciples, there was, there was great comfort in knowing that Jesus would be in the boat. So, I would suggest to you that John chapter 6, the account here, is that they couldn't comprehend who Jesus was. I mean, they knew that he was more than just a normal person. But this is not where Peter, this is, this is before Peter said, you know, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And if you go through the Gospels, the question is, who do people say that I am? Right? Some say Elijah, some say this, some say that. So, so I want you to think about this here. Jesus ordered them to go without him that, that, he might, that they might learn that he orders and provides. That he's the great I am. That he's present. God's there, and then he knows all there is to know, whether he's praying on the mountain <laughs> or he's walking on the water. He knows. Uh, the second devotional thought here is about resistance and disruptions. Uh, storms in life. You know, tomato, tomato, it's the same thing. Storms in life are disruptions, aren't they? It's resistance. You know, and oftentimes we forget that, that God orders those storms, doesn't he? Consistently orders those storms. Why? Not to harm us or to make us sink. 
The winds and the waves were keeping them from getting to the other side. It was the divine reason for it all. Uh, scripture tells us they got into the boat in the evening. Matthew and Mark tell us that Jesus shows up on the water at the sixth watch. One commentator did the math. He says, well, evening's about 6 p.m. And the fourth watch is 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Let me see. They were on the water for about eight, nine hours struggling? Why? And, and, and John tells us in the account here, they only made it like three, three and a half miles. So, uh, if, you, if you take a look at the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee is 13 miles long and eight miles wide. So they only made it like, you know, going off to halfway. You know, I, I started to think about this. You know, maybe the fishermen, you know, Peter, James, and John, didn't have a really good feeling about this one. Do you ever, ever kind of say, yeah, I'm not sure I really want to do this. I don't really have a good feeling about this. I, I have a pastor friend who was going to go down to see a friend in Maryland. I'm sorry, Delaware. And uh, he calls him up. He goes, Eddie goes, you know, I'm not coming. I don't have a good feeling about this. It's like, you never you have like that sixth sense, that premonition, right? Uh, Mark, Mark's account tells us um, that as they were rowing, they were straining. Uh, the word literally means vexed, harassed physically. It actually is, can be translated tormented. I mean, th this is not like they're frantic, frantic rowing. It's metaphorically they're tormented. I mean, they're not making any ground, maybe taking on water. It was not an easy time. And those are the storms and disruptions, right? You, you can sit back and take a look at the storms that God has sent your way, the, disrupt, the, the disruptions, the resistance. You know, just never, ever seem to be going anyplace, right? And so the picture here is a struggle to get to the other side. And, you know, that's a metaphor for life. Constant struggles, ongoing challenges, impediments of every size, endless winds and waves. And, and get this, this is not a picture of God not being there. That's the point. He was there. He's always there. And so I, I, I think it's important to stop and ask these questions. Why does God order the struggles and the challenges? Why are they that important? How do they shape us spiritually? What do these times of resistance teach us? Who sees us through such occasions? H have you ever noticed that there's never a good time for a disruption or a storm in life? I mean, it's never the worst timing, but it's, there's never a good time. It's kind of like getting a flat tire, right? There's never a good time to get a flat tire. I mean, maybe it's not always the worst time, but there's never a good time. <coughs> Timing's always terrible. And so this is the right way, though, to understand it. N not that it's terrible, it's because God has ordered it. He orders the disruptions, too. He orders the storms, the resistance. They're divinely intended because God provides a way through, and he wants us to see that way through. I also want you to notice, too, he always shows up at just the right time. Amen? When we're at our wit's end, when our emotions are frayed, we've just had it. He always does the right thing. He brings peace and calm. He's got the right antidote, the right solution, the right miracle to the problem or situation. God's timing is everything. It's perfect in all ways. So what, what dis disruption are you dealing with these days? Could we see the coronavirus as a disruption? I would say so. It's global, in fact. <laughs> I think it's intended to get people to look up. I don't get dismayed or bothered by it. I really don't. I said to my sister last evening, 
you know, if I'm meant to get it and die from it, then praise God, he puts me out of my misery. I'm in heaven. Amen? Some people are so paralyzed by fear with this thing. And of course, you know, you get the drum beats of the constant fear mongering. It's a virus. Not the bubonic plague. People get sick and die. But you take a look at this as, as, as a big disruption. Maybe God's trying to, even through all the fear mongering, maybe God's trying to get people like, you know, hello, look up, trust and obey, trust and rely. The third principle and devotional thought here, I want you to see that God breaks through the darkness and the loneliness in the midst of the storm. Uh, now, there's nothing worse than being in the dark and being lonely. And I think we've all been there, right? We're, we've been in the dark and we've been lonely. Now, I know that there were several disciples in the boat. I'm assuming that maybe all the disciples were there. I don't really know. But they were not alone in this sense. But when you think about loneliness, loneliness, loneliness isn't simply defined by not having people around you. Some of the times that I've been loneliest is when I've been in the crowd. So loneliness is not being defined as by yourself. It's a state of heart and mind. You're just lonely. You can't really rely on somebody, trust somebody, talk to somebody, share your burdens or your concerns. And also, God bless you, and also darkness is not only defined physically, it's mentally and spiritually. Some of the darkest times that I've ever been in have been mental and spiritual. Physically, Tuckalichi Caverns, Bob. You want to experience darkness? Go to the Tuckalichi Caverns. And uh, if you spend 30 days in there, you come out blind. With no light, you come out blind. Legally, literally, you'll never see anything again. That is pitch blackness darkness. You know, we use the expression, I'm in the dark about this one. <laughs> They're in darkness, right? In other words, you have a situation where, you know, why is this happening? I don't understand. And then you take darkness and loneliness and you couple them together. Oh, that's, that's a very bad place to be. I've been there. What, it, what is the cause for experiencing such despair? Why am I feeling lonely? Why am I feeling like this? Now, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm alluding to this as metaphors for, you know, for life, you know, darkness and loneliness, right? And working through various situations. But there are times where we uh, just need to trust in the Lord all the more. When we're in a dark place. When we're lonely. That's... That's when we need to function. And that's one of the reasons for the purposes of Jesus orchestrating events and ordering them. We need to find the capacity to overcome and to see the hand of God. Years ago, I, I was out uh, in the Finger Lakes region ministering. I did a couple summers when I was in Bible school. Um, you know, summer camp ministry out in the Finger Lakes region. And um, one of the perks for being staff was that we had a chance to go water skiing on the lake, right? The, the campers didn't get a chance to do that. And we went out at night on the boat, you know, on Lake Canadegua. Not the largest of the lakes, but <laughs> large enough, right? And um, it was really cool. I remember sitting there and we had like a little devotional and we sang a little song and you can hear the water and the like, you know, the little waves slapping against the boat. We had like this little, I don't know, bug light to identify us in the, because there are other, other boats on the lake, right? And I felt so blessed and so at peace. You know, it was a great, great time. But I also remember sitting there thinking, what happens if we struggle to get back to shore? 
what happens if we start taking on water? What happens if this is like we start to sink? Because we had, we had heard a motorboat. And it was like, where's this guy's light? We didn't see him coming. Now, accidents happen all the time on the water, right? And I started to think, how would I handle this? If there were winds and waves, if the boat capsized, <laughs> if I'm in the water, you know? I don't think I would have been as reflective. I don't think I would have felt as blessed. I don't think my mindset for the moment would have been the way it was as I experienced it. And yet, if you stop and think about it, isn't that what God wants to develop and change? Our, our mindset in the moment of like when it's helter-skelter. Now, I want you to think about these disciples here, right? They knew the lake. Most of them knew the lake by the back of their hand. Uh, yet darkness and waves change everything, right? And you don't see the lights at the shore. The clouds make it ominous. The landscape is different, right? You got to be able to identify where you are on the lake. The coastal lights at 3 a.m. are probably mostly out. You don't see much. And so what I'm suggesting to you is that the familiarity of the lake to them is gone. They're not familiar with it. They don't know. And, and, and so that's the, that's the incident that's designed and intended to bring them into a greater appreciation for finding Christ in the storm. The familiarity is gone. It's a life and death situation of finding God. That they would handle the stress and difficulty with great grace and steadfastness. Because that's what the saints do. Great grace and steadfastness compared to the way the world handles it. I want you to think about this too. Jesus knew that there was a day coming where he physically would not be with them. They needed to cope without him. You know, I had a, I had a conversation the other day with somebody about Judas. Because I, I think that Judas was in, in this mix here. I had a conversation the other day about Judas and all the missed opportunities that Judas had to come to faith in Christ. This was one of them. And he totally missed it. The fourth principle and final devotional thought this morning. I want you to stop and think about the profound effects of God's arrival in moments like these. Because, you know, I said earlier that uh, his timing is perfect. Uh, but it's more than perfect. Because God, God here shows up in the storm and amidst the, dis the disruptions here. They literally see him walking on the water, right? But look at the opportunities it, 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 that it affords. If you go to Matthew's account, Matthew tells us that Peter got out and walked on the water. And he also sunk. So you talk about finding God arriving in moments like these. There's opportunities. There's opportunities that abound. And, and I started to think about this here. What does it do for their spirits? What does it do for our spirits when God shows up in the midst of the storm, the waves and the wind, and he shows up and he, and he lifts the situation? What does he do? What does it do for your spirit? I'll tell you what happens. The darkness is lifted. The loneliness is gone. The storms are gone. The resistance is gone. And you get way to the other side very quickly. It's a beautiful picture of what happens spiritually. And you see the miraculous when God shows up. You always see the miraculous. Now, if you take a look at the text here, some think that there were two miracles that happened. Uh, there's definitely one. 
we have the obvious calming of the winds and the waves. But notice what John says in verse 31, I'm sorry, 21. And immediately the boat was at land to which they were going. Um, I think that this is the second miracle here. Uh, J. Vernon McGee says, um, this quote, this may be another miracle, or John may mean with no delay they reached the other side since the water is now calm. Or it may be the language of love with him in the boat. It didn't seem far to the other side. I think all of that's a possibility. I think it's the miracle myself. Uh, one miracle, two miracles, three miracles. How many do you need? Right? But stop and think for a minute. How many times have we been the recipients of the miraculous? I'll bet you I could parade each and every one of you up here and you could tell me a story about how God provided in the dark and lonely days whether you had little or you know we didn't know where the next meal was coming from or whatever you could tell me a story about the miraculous hand of God showing up and delivering you right I know you can that's why you're here this morning because he's done a miracle in your life and your heart you know he's for real you see his hand. He shows up in your life. Now, uh, I use the word miraculous broadly here. I've talked about this a couple of years ago. It's a God wink. It's more than coincidence. It's providentially seeing how God brings people in situations. And together, uh, somebody was telling me something the other day where, they, where they, they went away for a weekend. And they said, well... You know, God gave me a sign here, and God gave me a sign here, and God gave me... And he said, I knew the whole weekend was of God. I know you can tell me stories like that. You know, sadly, today, the, the miracles that people are looking for are like the parting of the Red Sea or something like that. Is that, is that what we really need? Are, are, we that, are we that, like, dense and blind and dumb to faith? I mean, I, I, I think not. I don't need a parting of the Red Sea. This is what I see here. When God shows up, his timing's always perfect. It's always the miraculous. He always delivers, and it's always a learning experience. All the time. Uh, sometimes the learning experience is right then and there. Maybe it's two months later, like, you know, the mom and pop grocery store shoot out. Very, very dense. Uh, maybe we're just to be reminded that God sent the event. Maybe there's something like really profound that he wants us to learn. Or maybe he just wants to remind us that it's providential. In, in this context here, it was that they would know that he's the great I am, that he's the bread of life, that he orders and provides. And the takeaway here is take courage in these truths. Don't be afraid. It's okay. I am, I am actually amazed at how many people are paralyzed by fear with the coronavirus. I mean, I'm talking about paralysis I don't think God ever intended to be that way do not be afraid take courage he orders and provides is this a disruption yeah there's there's a divine reason for it but I'm not sure that God wants us to live in that way. And I've actually have seen some people that don't have Christ and they're not paralyzed by it. I should make a stop and think the other day. You know, think, think. You know, the other day I had a, I actually had a chance to uh, witness to somebody. You know, I've been waiting for an opportunity, you know, uh, and I just, God just brought it out of the clear blue. Um, I didn't see it coming. Kind of like the church renovation. 
Uh, this person is not fearful. They don't run around with a mask. They don't really, they're not concerned at all. But they don't have Christ. That should give them great concern. But they don't see it right now. Right? But uh, man, I'm telling you, God just brought it and uh, it was a great, great time. Holy Spirit, driven, led, fed. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Never ceases to amaze me what he does. You know, and he lifted darkness and loneliness in a relationship and he just opened it right up. He blossomed it right up. There's something happening with that. You see? So anyway, that's what God has laid upon my, my heart this morning. And uh, there's a lot of, lot of uh, devotional thoughts and truths that, that, and takeaways here. And I hope, I hope that you reflect on that later this day and this week. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, um, may we be uh, consistently reminded that you order and provide down to every detail and circumstance, event and situation in our lives. Uh, there's nothing that you don't know about in our lives. There's nothing that you don't know about regarding tomorrow or next week, next month, next year. And may we take courage. Uh, may we not be afraid. Uh, may we bless you for being ever present in our lives. The great I am, the bread of life, the one who provides. And we bless you for that. We want to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And we pray in Jesus' name, our great God and Lord and Savior. Amen.